Hi, everyone. It's Dr. Z, and welcome to another episode of Next Up Narcissism. Today's episode I've wanted to do for quite some time, but I feel that it's an extremely timely episode right now, especially with the recent Diddy and Cassie events that have come to light. And it's something that I have wanted to talk to you guys about for a while. But recently, the comments that I have been reading in response to the the video that has been out, the accusations from multiple people, and just the general disbelief of women who report abuse, physical, emotional, sexual, financial. It's a big problem in our society that women are just not believed the first time because they're trying to get attention or they're trying to get money. And then people have the nerve to ask, well, why didn't they come forward sooner? This is why. This is why. (laughs) Or why didn't they leave if it was that bad? So this episode, I'm going to focus specifically on eight main reasons why particularly women stay in abusive relationships, why it is that they can't just leave, why it is that they don't come forward sooner. Like I said, we've seen this in the last couple of weeks. Comments on social media takes two to tango. It was that bad. Why didn't she leave? So I hope this episode does two things. One, validates those that are listening to this in the hopes that they will come forward if they're in this situation. And the second thing is to educate those who maybe aren't in this situation, but educate you so that you can understand why it is that people don't come forward in abusive relationships, why it is they don't report it, why it is they don't talk about it, why they hide it, and why they stay. And I hope that by understanding this better, that people can then offer better support for those who are in these situations so that they can come forward. That's it. Hope you all enjoy the episode. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Next Up Narcissism. I have been wanting to do this episode for quite some time now, um, and then After the recent Diddy and Cassie events came to light again, uh, I really felt that this was a timely topic and I, I really wanted to take the time and discuss with people why women don't leave abusive relationships. Now, I am well aware that men are also abused in relationships and this applies to them too. However, for the purpose of this episode, I'm going to be speaking directly about women to women who are in these types of relationships. So I'm going to go through eight main reasons why women don't leave abusive relationships. And I'm going to hit on each of them and give you a description, give you an example and explain why that is the case. And, you know, leave some time at the end, obviously, to talk about what you can do to make yourself get to that point where you are able to leave and leave for the last time. Because I want people to understand also that it takes on average, I think the research says, about seven times for somebody to leave an abusive relationship for good. That means leaving, coming back, leaving, coming back. And what I tell people, and for those of you who are listening, understand that if you go back after you leave, that is not a screw up. 
That is not a failure. It is part of an extremely, as you know, long process and long journey. And sometimes you need to use those exits as almost kind of practice rounds for the real thing, right? And the way I kind of equate it is, you know, if you're going to play a tennis match and you've never played before, well, like you got to practice, right? Now, obviously, we're talking about people's lives here, not a tennis match, but it's it's the almost the practicing of it in a way. The, the seeing what happens when you leave so that you can target that area the next time so that you're your leaving is smoother or or your leaving is easier for you. It's never going to be easy. If it was easy, everybody would do it. Everybody would leave if they were in an abusive relationship. But unfortunately, that's not the case. So the reason why I wanted to do this specifically now was because of the blow up of Diddy and Cassie and the events that have transpired in the last couple of weeks. Now, Neither Cassie or Diddy are obviously my patients. I cannot diagnose anybody. I can only talk about what I have seen. And that is exactly what I'm going to do. So a while ago, I'm not going to get into the details of of the facts and all that, but a while ago, you know, Cassie had come forward with allegations of abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse. And Diddy very clearly stated that not only were those allegations false, but that Cassie was trying to smear his character, which is interesting to use those exact words because we know that the quote smear campaign is something that narcissists do frequently. I'll just put that there. Um, and accused her of just wanting a payday. That she was going after him for the money. And she got a lot of pushback. She had a lot of people saying, well, if it was that bad, why didn't you leave? Why are you bringing this up now. And it wasn't until there was actual video footage of him beating the crap out of her in a public space that people really believed her. And that is extremely problematic in our society. We should believe women the first time. We're so caught up as a society in assuming that people are bad and lying. But I want people to understand that why on earth would somebody go through such a traumatic situation, right? And and for what? Why? Why? What, what would? How, I mean, you know, he says, "Oh, well, I wanted her to get a. Pay. She wanted a payout." Okay, but really, and there were so many people that didn't believe her. It was really, it was really sad. The details she gave, and it, and here's the other thing: it wasn't just her. People have been reporting his behavior for decades. And we see this a lot with people in Hollywood, we see this with musicians, there's this really uncomfortable um, divide that happens. Because while somebody is a genius in the music industry, but as a human being, abuses the people around them, how how do we as a society look at that person? So it's always something that I've I've taken an interest into. I remember long, long time ago um, when Michael Jackson died. I remember exactly where I was, what I was doing. And I felt really awkward attempting to like mourn this death of this pop star that I had grown up with since the early 80s. Because he had done such horrible things to kids. And there were still people that didn't believe that to be true. So we we get in this really weird, uncomfortable situation. Um, So that's why I really, I want to address this. I I found it so upsetting. First of all, the video, massive trigger warning. If you haven't seen the video and you're easily triggered by that, I I don't recommend seeing it. Um, It's pretty brutal. And It wasn't until that came out that people believed her. 
And that is the tragedy. And I'll still see comments on social media. And listen, we're never going to get away from that. But I see comments on social media all the time, you know, still. Well, if it was that bad, why didn't she leave? It takes two to tango. I see that a lot about this. Um, she liked the lifestyle. She liked the money. She liked the attention. Okay. Those comments are what perpetuates abuse in our society. So I'm going to go through eight main reasons why women who are in these abusive relationships, celebrities, not celebrities, why they don't leave. And the rest of society looks at that inability to leave as, well, then it must not be that bad. Here's what I say to those people. You need to understand the absolute identity breakdown that occurs in these types of relationships. You are mentally brainwashed. You are not in a position to just leave. Think about cults for a second. You don't hear many people say, why didn't they just leave? Because there's this understanding with cults that people are brainwashed and that that's why they're not leaving. Because when they leave, they have to be deprogrammed and they have to go through this whole rigorous process to alter their way of thinking that has been implanted in them for so long. So why is it so difficult for people to understand that that same process, maybe vary here and there, is exactly what happens in narcissistic abuse? That's the whole point. Control and manipulation. That's it. So before I get into the eight things, I, I watched a documentary the other day. Um, it was TMZ's documentary on Tubi, T-U-B-I. And they did a whole series on the Diddy Cassie events. And it was really interesting. They interviewed a lot of people. They interviewed one guy who had known Diddy forever and was part of his career, was part of his, up, you know, his, his, his music, up and coming, all of that. And it was really fascinating to hear what he said. He said, I, I took notes, so I'm going to read it. He's a good guy. I've never seen him be abusive. He loves his mom. He loves his kids. He gives jobs to a ton of people. He takes care of people. He's always there for people. And I'm listening to this thinking, he probably does appear that way outwardly. I don't doubt that for a second. I think that there is a narrative about him that people have either bought into or have not. But the one comment he said that really threw me was, well, no one's perfect. And listen, he's right. Nobody's perfect. I am, God knows I'm far from perfect. None of us are perfect. I don't even know what perfect means. I'm going to go with perfect's boring. How about that? Perfect leads to procrastination and just anxiety. So no one's perfect. That's correct. But I'm not willing to accept no one is perfect as an out or as an excuse or as a justification for abuse of any kind, period. That one statement really kind of sent me. So then they interviewed some other people. One person described him as, I quote, a saint, a hero, and a monster, all in one person. He would fly off the handle. He would have rage episodes, but then switch back immediately into that saint mode. Again, these are just things that people said, I'm not diagnosing anybody. I'm just reporting back what was said in the documentary. Um, and then they had interviewed um, Audrey O'Day, who was part of the group that Diddy had put together. And she described him and his behaviors, that he was a groomer. These are her words. He went out of his way to tell everybody what was wrong with them, to really pull out their vulnerabilities and exploit them. 
the thing that made me the saddest was that she said no one helped. Nobody helped her. I find it hard to believe that when you have an entourage and business people around you to that extent, that people don't see your behaviors. So she said nobody helps and that everybody around her had this narrative that was sold to them. And that was the narrative that everybody went with. Either don't talk about what you see, don't do this, don't do that. Um, you know, he's a good guy. It's all your fault. You did this, you did this. And so when you're so isolated from everybody around you and the only people that are around you feed you the same narrative, over time, that wears you down. You know, if I think I'm a good person, but then for years, I'm surrounded by people who feed me the narrative of how shitty of a person I am. And I have no way to see outside of that narrative. Eventually, it's going to wear me down and I'm going to start to believe these things to be true because, my God, if everybody around me see it, well, then re I, I really may be a terrible person. And that's what happens. So not only did nobody help, but everybody kept maintaining and facilitating this narrative. And the other thing she said is by being in this situation, it really warped her reality. That the gaslighting that went on completely changed her perception of the world around her. And that is a scary place to be. And she actually said, and I hear this from patients all the time, they don't even know they're being abused. They have no idea. And why don't they know? Because it's such a slow trickle. It's insidious. It starts super slow. And it, we've talked about this. It starts as love bombing. And then once you're in, it starts to crumble. The mask falls off. But you're so in already. And you're so isolated from people and they have such control over what you do and how you think that it's like being in a fishbowl and having no idea that you're a fish in a fishbowl until a hand comes into the fishbowl and pulls you out. And that's why, you know, I just posted a question on my Instagram. So if you don't follow me, definitely follow me, Dr. Z, psychologist. Um, I posted something yesterday, Memorial Day weekend yesterday, um, asking people to put in the comments section, what was the thing that helped them leave an abusive relationship? And I would say 75% of the comments that people left was social support. And why was it social support? Because it was somebody objective to the abuse who was able to not judge them and show them what was going on. They were the hand that removed them from the fishbowl. Without that, it's really difficult. And so you can imagine if everybody around you, all these flying monkeys, all these kind of soldiers, so to speak, following these rules are selling you this narrative. And after a while, you believe it to be true. So let me get into these eight things and go through them. So the first, why don't women leave? They're petrified. They're scared. They're not just scared because of what people are going to say about them and the character assassination that's going to ensue, because that will happen, obviously. And I always tell people when there's a character assassination by you or about you, do not go trying to prove it or fight it. The best thing to do is to not say anything to it, as difficult as that may be. Because what the narcissist is trying to do is they're trying to get a reaction from you because they don't have direct access to you. So if they can't access you, they're going to start to ruin your character. When you know the truth about them, they're going to start to ruin your character. So keep that in mind. The more they spread these lies, the more they develop this narrative and attempt to smear your character, it's because you know about them. That gives you power. So they're not only scared of that, but I don't know if people really understand this or not, but the highest, most riskiest time for physical violence is when a woman is leaving their abusive partner. While they're leaving or in the weeks shortly after, that is when there is the highest risk for violence. 
and unfortunately, murder. So they're petrified because I guarantee you, when you're dealing with somebody who has narcissistic personality disorder, I have no doubt that they have threatened you repeatedly on what would happen if you were to leave. They'll kill you. They'll kill your kids. They'll hurt you. They'll hurt your kids. They'll steal your kids. They'll take your money. I mean, there's a million things. They'll, they'll make you lose your job. So there, it, it's plain old fashioned fear. And if you don't have social support, that fear is going to keep you stuck. The next, the second is money. I already did an episode on financial abuse, so I'll, I'll kind of refer you back to that. But the reason why financial abuse is such a thing is because it keeps the person trapped in the relationship. They either have no access to finances or they have a job, they have their own money, but they're, they don't have access to it. Or they've been so conditioned to not spend their own money or spend money in general that it doesn't even come up as an option for them or they don't have their account passwords. They don't know where their money is. They they have to ask permission to even take money out. If they leave, maybe they haven't worked in God knows how long. I mean, I know someone very dearly who had a really good job. She was told she wasn't allowed to work because they didn't want her interacting with other males. For 20 something years, she didn't work. Finances is a big reason why it kept her in there so long. The third is shelter. Okay. Where are you going to go? Literally. Do you have somewhere you can stay? What if you have kids? Do you have somewhere where your kids can stay? What if you have pets? You know, people listening may be like, oh, that's stupid. No, it's not. No, it's not. Because they could hurt the pets. And I've seen that, unfortunately, a bunch of times. So where are you going to go? Do you have money to get an apartment? Do you have money to stay at a hotel? Do you have friends? You've been isolated probably for so long. Do you even have anywhere you could go? Maybe you haven't spoken to your parents in forever. So what I tell people is with the isolation aspect, I guarantee you at this point, if you've been isolated from your friends and family, they are probably extremely concerned about you. This would be the time to reach out to them and tell them you need them. So when I have people ask me, my sister's in a narcissistic relationship or my child is in a narcissistic abusive relationship, my adult child, I can't get through to them. They won't listen to me. What do I do? They won't talk to me. And I always tell them the same thing. Continue to be there for them in the event that they need to leave. That's it. Because you can make a massive difference in somebody's ability to get out of these abusive relationships. So if you think about it, other than scared, money, shelter, those are practical things. So when people say, why can't she just leave if it's that bad? This is why. This is why. Um, they could have run your credit into the ground. You can't even get a credit card. You don't know how to get a credit card. You don't know how to access money. The fourth thing, lack of support. And I talked about a little about this already, but one of the things that happens in narcissistic abusive relationships is that there is a total lack of outside support. Why? Because the narcissist does an extremely calculated and deliberate job of isolating you, not only from your family, but also your friends and your coworkers to the point where you either don't talk to them anymore or they've convinced you that they're terrible people. They've convinced you your family doesn't get you, that only they get you. No one loves you like I do. No one understands you like I do. Everybody else is jealous or everybody's trying to pull us apart. Or why do you let your parents influence your life so much? Or, you know, your friend Jamie, I don't really like her. I don't trust her. And this narrative constantly being given to you, fed to you slowly, while in the midst of love bombing, well, my God, why wouldn't you believe them? Maybe you've been perceiving it wrong this entire time. Because this person claims to know you so well, better than you know yourself, maybe, just maybe, they're right. And that's where the sense of self starts to crumble. The other reason why this lack of support is a big thing is because there's so much shame and guilt 
they don't want to tell anybody that they're being abused. And I got to be honest with you, when I see these comments out there, like, well, why didn't Cassie leave? Why didn't this one leave? This one just wants money. It's no wonder why they don't leave. They're petrified. No one's going to listen to them as it is. Plus, you add in all the social media stuff. They probably think everyone's going to think they're lying. And here's the other thing that I heard in that documentary. That, and again, this is this is what I heard. This is what people said on the documentary. That when he would abuse people, he would hit, and multiple women had said this, that he would hit them in places that nobody else would see. And sometimes abuse isn't physical. There is no hitting. It's emotional. It's manipulative. It's control. It's sexual abuse. And Cassie talked a lot about that, about having to engage in sexual acts that were actually uncomfortable for her. And again, people still said, well, takes two to tango. She did it. Of course she did. Because guess what would happen if she didn't? She even said that. She did it and went along with it because she was petrified of the abuse that she would endure if she didn't. That's why. The fifth thing, sometimes people, many people, until they get one one fin out of the fishbowl, they don't even know they're being abused. They know something's not right. I hear this all the time. I know something's not right, but I can't put my finger on what it is. They know it's controlling, they know it's manipulative, but they don't look at it necessarily as abuse because they they align abuse with physical abuse. Neglect, manipulation, control, sexual abuse. These are things that can be easily hidden. And yes, within intimate relationships, rape does occur quite frequently in narcissistic abusive relationships. Things like just you don't want to have sex and they force you to. But because they're your partner and they're charming to everybody else, nobody's going to believe you. Or maybe you're a bad spouse or a bad girlfriend or a bad boyfriend because you don't please your partner because you refuse sex. Here's the thing, though, especially with women. Women will describe repeatedly that their bodies have a visceral reaction to set when when they have to have sex with this abusive partner their body physically rejects them this is why you see so many things like hair loss rashes ibs pain it's your body like screaming for help in a sense um so a lot of times people don't recognize they're being abused and it's not until they hear what gaslighting is what narcissistic abuse is, what um, what financial abuse is, or, you know, examples of things like, you know, a narcissist will hide your keys and then tell you that you, you know, you're so irresponsible and this is why you can't have nice things and this is why you don't have a car because you can't take care of it and all these things, you know, on purpose. We don't think that people act like that. So my God, why would we think they would do that on purpose? So a lot of times people don't, and again, that's just one very specific example, but oftentimes they don't even know they're being abused. And then when they hear things like this, which is why I do and many other people do what they do to educate people, I like to say it's preventative medicine, but if you're in the relationship already and you hear these things and it gives it a label, it takes it outside from inside your head, you're all tangled up in your head. It takes this and puts it outside so that you can objectify it, look at it, name it, label it. And so that you now know there is a playbook and a pattern and that's extremely empowering. But before that, it's total chaos. You don't think there's a pattern. You walk on eggshells constantly in an effort to try to protect yourself. But the rules are arbitrary and there is nothing that can protect you. That's the problem. Um, the sixth thing is that after a long time, you know what? I shouldn't even say a long time. This could be a couple of weeks. Being with somebody who gaslights continuously, is abusive, love bombs, and then discards you and all the things in between. 
you not believing that you are a capable human, that you are a good person because you've been sold a narrative by this, by the abuser, along with all the people around them. You've been isolated from your family, so you can't get their feedback. You have no access to them to tell them about the abuse. You wouldn't even know what to say, even if you did. It's so hard to explain narcissistic abuse because isolated events, like I think they stole my keys to hide them to make me seem irresponsible. When you say that about somebody who appears extremely charming to everybody else, guess what happens? They tell you you're overreacting. So people that experience this type of abuse learn very quickly to keep it to themselves. So this strips you of your sense of self. It strips you of your identity. It strips you of your ability and your confidence in perceiving the world around you. So you then end up having to depend on your abuser to define your reality. And that's where that narrative gets so unbelievably embedded. Think about kids growing up in abusive environments. They're fed the narrative their entire life. When the narrative is 100% false, but they're fed this their whole life. They don't even realize that there's an, an, another way to look at themselves. They took this and ran with it. So their, their sense of self is stripped completely. I will have women and men tell me this all the time, that when they finally get out of the relationship, they feel like they are a shell of their former self. That who they were prior to the start of the abuse is no longer who they are now. Down to simple things like they don't know what their favorite ice cream flavor is. They don't know what type of music they like. They don't know what style of clothing they like. They have been told what to do, what to like, who to be. They were sold an identity and they ran with it. So when they leave these relationships and they realize that that identity was never theirs, they feel completely empty and scared and alone because they have to recreate who they are. And that's extremely difficult. And that's where therapy comes in. Um, but they're very vulnerable when they get out of these relationships. They, they don't have a sense of identity. I, I, I worked with, so, excuse me, so many people who would say, you know, I don't know what I want to do today because they've never had the option of choosing. I had one patient tell me that when, when her abusive partner moved out of the house and she was sleeping in the bed by herself now, she was like, Jamie, I don't even know what side of the bed I prefer. Should I try to sleep on the left side or the middle? So I always had to sleep on the right. I mean, it's just these small things we take for granted. One of my patients, she wasn't allowed to wear heels because he didn't want her to be tall. One wasn't allowed to go to the gym because they didn't want people looking at her in a sports bra. And because you don't tell people this, because there's this, this shame and guilt and embarrassment, you just accept it to be true. And before you know it, that's just what happens. So when you get out of these relationships and you say, I, I want to go to the gym, but there's so much anxiety that's, that's now with that and associated with after years of this abuse. So that's why, again, when people get out of it and they're like, oh, well, you know, you should go to the gym. Mm. You got to think about that before you say that. Maybe down the road, but they haven't been able to do anything. They haven't been allowed to do anything. So for them to jump into things that they're interested in, that they want to get back into, you got to give them some space, therapy, to figure out what it is, what it even is that they like. What is it that they enjoy? They may not even know because they were never allowed to know. The seventh thing, no job, or you work for your abuser, or you're in business with your abuser. And that's not coincidence. Many times in the love bombing stage, you will hear, particularly men say to their female partners, you should quit your job and come work for me. We'll take over the world. We'll corner the market. <laughs> or quit your job. Let me take care of you. You deserve this. I mean, in the beginning, that sounds great. I talk a lot about this in my financial abuse episode. I think it's episode five, five or four. Um, so you're not working, let's say, 
you have no earning potential because you haven't worked in 20 years, let's say. You, let's say you were told you need to stay and raise your kids, which great, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But when you're told you have to do it and that you were not allowed to work, well, that's different. That's not a choice. And so you have no job. So if you're going to leave and your abuser is the sole provider for income, what are you going to do? You haven't worked in God knows how long. Do you have a resume? Do you even know what you're interested in? Do you need to go back to school, get recertified and whatever it is? I mean, there's so many aspects to this that are daunting for somebody who is experiencing narcissistic abuse. It is hard enough for them to get out of bed and brush their teeth. And then people in society rip them apart when they leave because, well, they need to work. Yeah, they, they do. Correct. But... <laughs> The steps involved in having them get to that point, along with being totally fear, fearful, having no money, having nowhere to stay, having lack of support, questioning their sense of self, their sense of purpose, but they're going to go right out and get a job. I mean, I, again, this is why I'm doing what I'm doing, because I really want to educate people that it is not so black and white. You are doing so much more damage to these people who have been abused. Because they see things like this. They hear things like this. This is why women don't come forward. Forget being interrogated by, you know, attorneys and going through a trial and all that and the publicity. But like, just, just on social media alone, just from friends and family alone. Why didn't she tell anyone about this sooner if it was that bad? Why didn't she leave sooner? Why isn't she working? This is why. <laughs> you can tell I'm extremely passionate about this. I, I have been, I have been really angry at the Diddy Cassie comments that I have been seeing. Especially that it takes two to tango. That was, that's one of the most ignorant comments I can think of. Um, lastly, kids, if you have children with your abusive partner, it becomes a different game. And I say game because when the narcissist attempts to take you to family court, which family court is extremely not in the abuser's favor in many states. Um, there, let's say you have no money, you have no sense of self. You probably believe you're a shitty parent. You're scared to death. You have no money. You have no place to house your children. You're petrified you're going to lose custody. And let me tell you something. Don't think that just because you are the mom, that that guarantees you custody. Because I will tell you, when narcissists drag people through the family courts, there are some people are working on this and there's, I'm going to have an episode on this as well. The abuser does a really good job of manipulating the custody situation and can often make the mom look crazy can make the mom look unfit to be a parent, can say, okay, well, she has no money. She has nowhere to live. She's living on her friend's couch. She has no family. She has no job. She's on antidepressants. Well, yeah. She has a past of, of thinking about hurting herself. Well, yeah. But look at what she's been through. <laughs> doesn't mean she's an unfit mother. It means that she has been abused for so long and she is trying to keep her kids safe. But because of all of these variables to the public, it doesn't look like that. It looks like you have somebody who is a disaster who should not be in charge of kids. 
when that is not the case, not even close. The narcissistic, the abusive parent does not have the children's best interest in mind. If you are an abusive parent, abusive husband, you are also by nature an abusive parent. You may not hit your kids. You may not verbally abuse your kids. But if you do that to your spouse, you're abusing your kids indirectly. So when you hear, when you see comments like, not everybody's perfect, or they were at rock bottom when they did this to you, or there's two in a relationship. Why didn't you just leave? These eight things, plus so many more, but for the sake of this, I'm going to give you the top eight. Um, this is why. So I hope what this does is give people who are listening some validation. If you're going through this, I hear you. I see you. I am fighting for you. Um, and for people that maybe aren't in this situation to learn from this and to stand up for abuse survivors so that they feel safe and protected so that they can come forward. Because as long as society looks at it as they're trying to get money, they're trying to get notoriety, they're trying to get, you know, who knows what just want to be out there in the public looking good. So that's why they're saying they were abused for so many years. I want you to think twice before you ask yourself, well, why didn't they leave? So that's that. Um, I hope that really sinks in with a lot of people. And I really think this was a necessary and very timely episode. Um, again, if you can't tell by my voice, I'm extremely passionate about this and I really wanted to get this across to people. Uh, if you have any questions about this, definitely check out my Instagram page, Dr. Z Psychologist. I post a ton on there about this. Also, I have a support group that I'm running during the month of July. The support group is exactly for the people that I'm talking about that need that support from the outside to pull them out of the fishbowl. This is what I'm talking about, okay? Um, my website, drjamiezuckerman.com, I post a ton of resources on there as well. Use them, truly. Um, anything that can help pull you out of that cycle and show you objectively what is really happening without judgment. So that is it for today's episode. I will see you next week on Next Up Narcissism. Everybody have a great day. Hi, everyone. It's Dr. Z, and I am thrilled to announce the launch of my summer support series, Narcissistic Abuse Live Virtual Support Group. This is for those who are either currently experiencing narcissistic abuse or who have experienced narcissistic abuse in relationships of all kinds. You can register for the support group series on my website, drjamiezuckerman.com, and click the workshops tab and scroll until you see summer support series, live virtual support group. This is a four session support group. Each group is an hour long from July 8th, July 15th, July 22nd, and July 29th, Mondays, 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern time. Again, to register and to get more info, head to my website, drjamiezuckerman.com, click on the workshops tab, or if you have any questions or need additional information, please email info at drjamiezuckerman.com. Again, that's info at drjamiezuckerman.com. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Next Up Narcissism. I hope you found it useful, but most importantly, I hope you found it validating. Want to work one-on-one -on -one with me? Visit my website at drjamiezuckerman.com to book a personalized coaching session and be sure to check out my on-demand workshops on topics like co-parenting with a narcissist, life after leaving, anxiety management strategies, and more. 
Again, that's drjamiezuckerman.com. You'll also find links to my interactive workbooks, merchandise, resources, and newsletter sign up. Next Up Narcissism is as much your podcast as it is mine. I want to hear your feedback and what you want to hear. So make sure to leave a podcast review wherever you listen or send an email to nextup at drjamiezuckerman.com. Again, that's nextup at drjamiezuckerman.com. Be sure to subscribe so that you never miss an episode. And as always, thank you so much for listening. Make sure to tune in next week to see what's up next on Next Up Narcissism.